Welcome back to the Rally Report. I am no longer going to say which episode number it is on the intro because I've screwed it up twice now and I clearly cannot count. But special guest today, she's really one of the most mysterious players on tour who keeps relatively a low profile, which is why I'm incredibly stoked to have her on. She's a top world-class squash player by day and abstract artist by night. Welcome, Sabrina Sobe. What's up? <laughs> Thank you, you for doing? the kind introduction, John. I'm very <laughs> happy to be here, and that was a very generous uh, intro. <laughs> Did I get that right? Would you consider yourself an abstract artist or just an artist in general? I mean... Because I did I, look at a couple... Yeah, I mean, I do primarily abstract work when I just like to draw. But, um, I mean, artist works for a lot of, uh, a whole realm of things. So I think yeah. any sports player could be an artist, in my opinion. <laughs> She's versatile. She's versatile with her artwork. <laughs> and I did see that you can commission pieces for me, right, with, and on your on your yes, account? You so can. quick plug, quick plug there. Plug. <laughs> before we get into squash. So not to embarrass you to start this off, but I know you briefly mentioned about getting your wisdom teeth out yesterday. Not to call you out immediately. I can't stop looking at my chubby cheeks. <laughs> okay. uh, how was that? How was that procedure? Successful procedure? Nothing? Yeah, Any... I just got the bottom two out. So luckily not terrible. It took like 30 minutes. Um, oh. Just numbed up the, the back of the mouth and, mm -hmm. you know, took the teeth out and then I was kind of okay that day. And then yesterday, which was the second day after the procedure was pretty rough. It just like, Ooh. you feel like weird. Cause you're just kind of eating like soft foods and not really getting the proper yeah. nutrients. Like it's just uncomfortable. You're like slamming ice between your face all day. Oh, so, I don't know. Oh, it's no. like pretty rocky, but today I feel oh. a little better. Yeah. A little swollen, obviously, but less I think than yesterday. Well, no one can tell. No one can tell except no the fact that I just called the whole thing out <laughs> to start this off. But um, so, how's how's this summer been? This off season? So, I saw on Twitter that you had um, completed your chapter as health coach at Join yeah. Found Health, yeah. and so could you? Could we say that you're proudly an official, full time, committed squash player now? I am, and that was yeah. quite recently. It happened Friday. Yeah. I was at this company working as a health coach since November of 2020. So I was there for quite a while and, um, and I loved all every second of it. I'm so happy I was able to have that experience as it was able to kind of give me that break from squash that I, I mm. definitely needed at the time. Um, I also, um, I didn't know how much I like was, I actually enjoyed being a health coach. It was more so an opportunity just to kind of, make some money and have a working experience um, since it was right out of the pandemic, like U.S. squash wasn't funding us. There was not many tournaments. So it was kind of like a challenging period for everybody. So I, when I got that opportunity, I really was fortunate for it. Um, and obviously I enjoyed it because I stuck with it for almost, almost two years. Um, it was a platform that catered towards weight management and weight care for anybody who really wanted to just kind of like get healthier. Um, and I didn't realize how much I loved the coaching side of it. Uh, mm. I did some squash coaching in the past and that's great, but there was just another category when you start taking um, people from all over the, the United States and kind of having that uh, experience where you just don't know anything about that and learning. Like, I also like psychology, so it was, it was really cool to add that aspect into it and just take coaching to a whole other health world. I see. Squash, so it was cool. Nice. Um, I'm, a, I'm a squash player. What, what went through the decision of leaving? Was it, did you feel like you wanted to just further pursue squash or was there another yeah, reason behind? It was basically like I was reflecting a lot um on last season and I wanted to like figure out what I could do better for this coming season. And I have felt a very strong shift in passion and motivation uh, over the last couple of months with squash. Um, and I, a, a huge part of my realization was just that awareness of like, there's not much else I can actually add into my days with this part-time job. Um, mm. It was added a lot of stress in many tournaments just due to travel and time zones and just trying to balance like the work when you have a match and just my mind was so like scattered and split a lot. Yeah. Um, just hopping from like meetings straight onto court and stuff like that. 
Um, Did you have to like do this even in between tournaments or were they accommodating? Yeah, I mean, it's a remote job and it's um, very flexible hours. So I would, I would do it um, in Egypt and anywhere else I was traveling and in the UK and, um, and it was like, I don't know, it's because it was so flexible. I felt like I could handle it even when I was traveling. Mm. Maybe if it was more like structured time hours commitment, it would have yeah. been like easier to be like, oh, can I actually have this day off because I'm traveling? But like, <laughs> I'm like dying, but it's okay. Um, so I really I wanted to like go into this season being like, okay, I'm like full time see what I can do with squash, like just put my energy into it and really like try to do my best with, with, with it all. That's Damn. So I guess it's a, it's a dangerous time ahead because <laughs> Serena Sobe has decided to fully commit to this. But, um, so, that helps actually. <laughs> Sabrina, so, okay. I kind of like to dive into this. It was one of the big points. I, so I know I wouldn't say you've outwardly spoken about this, but you haven't shied away either about discussing how you feel about being quote unquote a professional squash player um, and also just your nature of relationship with squash. And I wanted to kind of dive into it. And I guess you kind of alluded to it right now about how, what your headspace is at right now, but how we felt recently with it. And if you could just give us some insight about how you have been feeling about squash in general throughout your life. Yeah, definitely. Um, I could successfully say that right now I am feeling like the most passionate, the most motivated, I've ever been and like just the most excited actually as well about mm. upcoming seasons, tournaments, not even actually as much as like the PSA season, but more so in just like developing and improving my own squash game. Um, which is just like, it, it's a weird feeling to be honest, because for the longest time, <laughs> probably my entire <laughs> life, squash has just been something that I was like, just, you know, good at <laughs> And then, like, I don't yeah. know, after college, I was like, I don't really know what else to do. I don't really want yeah. to. It's such a huge part of my identity. I don't want to give it up right now. Like, it, it was just kind of, like, unspoken. But I was like, yeah, I'm mm. going to do this because. I'm good at it. Um, it's like I have to. <laughs> well, and obviously, like, pressure from family and myself and stuff like that. Um, but I, and even, like, the past season, which was, like, 16 months long, like definitely like after COVID, it was a bit rough just getting motivated again for, for all reasons. Um, but still like, I was kind of wary of like whether I wanted to do this as well. Um, hey, wait, I think I, wait, not to interrupt you. I think I saw one of your interviews where you're like, fuck yeah, it's COVID. No one can play. Everyone's on the same page. So like, I'm actually <laughs> glad that no one can play it out. <laughs> that was like, I know it like sucked for everybody. But in terms of taking a break of yeah. from squash without like that pressure of like oh shit, oh hundred like, percent uh, no you can you can cuss on this <laughs> <You're really joking. laughs> this person's training or like that that fear of like getting behind and stuff it was just like wow you know everybody's in the same boat like I can finally like just enjoy whatever I wanted to do and I obviously love being active and stuff so like like that's not never an issue but it was just like kind of that mental break from squash mm -hmm. really important. Is it, is it frustrating? Cause it, it, I think you just mentioned about the pressures from your family and I'm sure even like the squash community outside world, just being like, Sabrina, you're so talented. Like, why are you not, do the people like give, give that a lot to you? And does that get in your head? They do. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's okay. Like, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'm going to do my best. Like, <laughs> it's kind of what, uh, I don't know. I guess growing up, uh, Especially with my brother and sister on tour, or not on tour, it's like playing squash like from a young age. I can, I can remember just being like kind of told I got was most talented or whatever, like whatever yeah. it is, whether it's true or not. Like for me, yeah, it's like, yeah. dang, you know, like I'm not gonna <laughs> let that like get into my head ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, wait, so. How how has how has this off season been for you? How, like prepping up for, you know, yeah. like, was it is this your first first official off season you've had since I guess you kind of entered into the COVID zone? It absolutely is, and I, I feel oh, like shit. kind of something not wrong, but like 
don't know. I didn't, I didn't, have that, I didn't schedule like a block of training, and I didn't realize how kind of <laughs> like how normal I was. It's like, oh, I'm starting my five, six week training block, and I'm like, damn, I just did two weeks of camp, like an exhibition week, and then another exhibition week, and like kind of like training in between those times. And I'm like, okay, maybe that wasn't the best prep, but again, it's yeah. my off season I've ever had ever. So. Yeah learning processes and then, you know <laughs> I was just casually like, you know appoint put appointment for your wisdom teeth get pulled out no biggie yeah. just get a good <laughs> my first event just hoping that it doesn't last a week but yeah, whatever it's still life in the end you gotta you gotta do mm. the important adult things you gotta make some money doing camps and exhibitions and also like to me personally I saying if I was in Philly just training for five six weeks in a row like that would be the easiest way for to burn me out before mm. the season yeah so I'm kind of glad that I had this summer to just kind of learn from maybe two weeks of camps too much or stuff like that like just to figure it out so learn yeah I mean so relatively near learning process um yeah if you don't mind what what have, what have you been working on if you don't mind sharing to the uh, squash game yeah, Ooh. to the enemies out there. <laughs> to the enemies. Um, <laughs> I think, to be honest, like, the main uh, or one of my biggest uh, weaknesses was just kind of, like, my mental game it, uh, mm. last season and just that kind of, like, lack of belief of being able to compete with the, the top pros um, and, like, also just kind of staying – being like up for every match regardless of how you are feeling within a tournament and on the go and you know playing back-to-back events I think that was a something that I really that that like kind of made it more difficult I guess that it like didn't get put me at my best potential because you know when you don't have that belief when you walk on court that you could beat these girls um, then it's really makes it really hard to beat them. <laughs> it's really <laughs> impossible. <laughs> so I think I had to just develop that throughout um, the past couple months, and I think I, I have, which was really good. Just with like the more it, it comes with experience, I guess, and and close close win- losses, like very close, almost like you almost beat them, but then you're you don't, and then just understanding the the irritation in that that's kind of yeah, yeah. that's what helped me spark my like passion and motivation more so um yeah i think you've had you've had you've had a couple really fucking close yeah, ones this like, season you know you're like damn it it was so close and like, yeah. and just knowing that those are so painful actually yeah. like that was a good sign i guess now i can talk yeah. about it and say it's good <laughs> moment you're like the worst which thing. which which one stung the most? Not not to keep it on a downer, but <laughs> that's a great question. I uh, they all were brutal, but the one that really stunk was um, I think the Nationals against Amanda. To be honest, oh shit! <laughs> which no way. It was like kind of off the radar. Um, it was after like all the it was after the all the PSAs. Like kind of everyone transition to the off season but that was really really annoying i lost um in the finals like in a very close four games i know we played earlier yeah. in the season um and that was a, a brutal one too but and this match felt like more i don't know just like more competitive if that makes sense oh i see I think uh, Amanda had actually submitted a question on Instagram about asking about how you felt that you had to stay on court after the black oh, ball loss. That's, like, that's fucked. That's fucked that they made you stay there. <laughs> well, did they make you stay just be, be simply because of the whole sibling thing? 100%. No, oh. no one has ever lost and been asked to stay on court. Before. Here, share, share the platform with the winner here. Let me yeah. just ask you a couple questions. <laughs> but, like, maybe it was... I think if it was like a three love loss, it would have been like easier. I don't know. It was like five games. It was kind of yeah. tight. Like I was visibly pissed off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's also funny because I feel like you usually don't come across like very upset. Like you don't like come over like throwing a tantrum. So <laughs> <laughs> if Sabrina's upset, she's very upset. 
Um, <laughs> so have you have you been training at this Spectre Center? Is that your main like home base? Yeah. Would you say with where you're training and getting coached out of? Yeah, I would say it's the place that I'm at the most. Um, I use the gym and use like the group sessions there um, every week, and kind of it's like a great spot to just like get games as well because always there's always courts available. Mm-hmm. Like, guests are able to come in very open. Um, I also go out to Haverford and work with my main coach, Alex State there. So I'll go oh, like, I see. A week just to get out of the city as well and um, have that available. And I also use the racket club of Philadelphia just, just to use the gym there. I live right by it. So it's very close. So I can use the gym there and also like play with some members there. Good practice. So I yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you liking Philly? I am, yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's, like, going to be my home forever, but fine city for, like, to be where I am right now. Where else are you thinking of? If I play squash, nowhere else. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't think I get it. Unless, like, I went rogue. And, I mean, <laughs> not going back to Egypt, but I'll maybe go to... Uh, the UK or something. I don't know. That could be fun for a bit. That, that could be, yeah. Um, <laughs> wait, so, I, I, well, speaking of, like, home base, so I know you, when you initially decided to go professionally, you moved to Egypt. Did I get that correct? Yeah. What What made you decide to go there? Because I found this funny when I was, like, reading up on you because, you know, you expressed how you were kind of hesitant about going professional, and then you, you decided to go to the most intense place for squash. So I was like, yeah. something is not adding up with this move. But yeah, I wanted to know why you decided to move there and how you felt about that experience. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to get a taste. I don't. I really don't know. I think it was like, <laughs> I didn't know where else to go in the States. Um, I feel like the only options were like Boston or New York. Like Philly wasn't a th- really a thing yeah. at the time. Um, I knew it was going to be. I knew the Spectre Center was in the works. Um, and I didn't want to go to Boston. I didn't want to stay in Boston. I didn't definitely didn't want to be in New York trying to be a professional athlete. Like that would be the hardest thing <laughs> of all time. Like all my friends in the city, like and I'm trying to be busy. It's a dangerous I mean I'm living in the city right now. It's uh yeah the weekends are nonsense. <laughs> yeah, so, um, <laughs> My dad was also like looking to move to Egypt, so mm. I was like, "This kind of sounds like a, kind of a cool experience. I'd love to." My coach was out there at the time, or who I wanted to work with, who was Mohammed Reda. Um, and I don't know; it sounded like fun and exotic for a bit. It was for a yeah. period of time, and then I was like, "This is like the most wash centric yeah. place of all time." Like I could. <laughs> It, it just didn't fit your personality. What do you say after like a couple months? Yeah, it, it just didn't fit with my personality. Like, yeah, I feel like it's a live or live or die by squash over there. Yeah, it, it is, and that's a, amazing. And it's part of yeah. the reason why the Egyptians are so good. Um, mm-hmm. But personally, like a lot of the reasons why I love Philly, like aren't really available out and out in Cairo. So I struggled with just like the non squash scene and. I'm not like I don't like to stay up late. <laughs> like that was a big thing. I don't like being in the car that long. And you have to like trap drive for an hour every session. Like oh god, on the Fridays, which is the first day of the weekend, like it's a late. You know, meet up at like 10 p.m. and I'm like, no, oh, 10 p.m. Yeah, that's oh yeah, like that's so so normal. Like late dinners, like late. Morning. Oh shit! I did. I had no idea. Yeah, it's just like things like that that just like did not fit with my lifestyle. So, so you when did you call it quits over there and then move back to Philly? Was it like after a year of being it there? Was, I was going to stay for a year, and then COVID hit in March. Oh, okay, so I stayed there for three months, and then I left. I went back to New York in June. So like, I see. It. Okay, yeah, just so to get like, the timelines. I could have stayed there longer if COVID hadn't hit. Oh, but, uh, oh, in e- Egypt. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I would have I stayed probably a few. Like, I would have liked to have made it a full year, but yeah, it was like COVID shut everything down everywhere, and I was like, okay, kind of my That's transition it. to back to the states. 
<laughs> Welcome back home. Type of thing. Yeah. Um, well, I want to I want to go back to the whole Spectre Center thing because I think I was ta- I've been interviewing a lot of US players about something I've noticed is some people seem to very um, how, how do I put this very like into the program. They're like all for the Spectre Center, and then yeah. there are others who like are not really part of that center. And then there's someone like you who's in between. Yeah. Uh, what I mean- What's could you walk us through why you? I guess why you didn't decide to fully commit to the Spectre Center, but you you have like multiple places you're hitting at and training out of. I think per like just personal preference, I mm. I I need a variety of places to be at. Um, I, I get very stale or bored if I like am at the same place at the same time each day and each week. Um, which is why I like to go out to the suburbs or switch up training at the Racket Club. I also, um, as much as I, I love the team and I love all the people there, like I do like to do some sessions on my own, mm. on my own time too. Like I don't sometimes, that what I struggled with in the beginning was like, you need to be here at 10 a.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. And I was like, I don't know, man. Like, I'm, back, <laughs> I'm back in high school. Yeah. <laughs> Structured, yeah. This is part of the reason why we do the thing. Like we are <laughs> professional athletes. Like we kind of have that that uh, variability and our um, that opportunity to create our own time and, and sessions and kind of like do things more by feel rather than a very rigid structure. And and that was what the Spectre Center was kind of uh, promoting in the beginning, like almost a year ago. And now um, they have kind of become very oriented in like understanding that we do have specific needs and every, um. not everybody is follow, wants to follow the same program and, they are very understanding with that. So, so I'm, I'm very happy with the opportunity to, to have the program and to be there. Um, and I'm also very grateful that I don't feel like penalized for also needing space and other places. to. Be. Yeah. It would be, it'd be a bad if they're like, we're cutting all funding. If you don't come yeah. at 10 AM in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, okay. Wait, so Sabrina, I wanted to roll back the clock here at your time at Harvard. Um, I'm curious why you decided on Harvard in general. Um, did it like, I'm, I'm going to take a jab at that. It didn't really have a lot to do with the squash program or did it like have a lot to do with the squash program? It, it kind of did have a lot. Oh, to shit. Do with squash. I don't know. Okay. Um, at the time, I, I mean, it's such a tricky year. I don't like feel as comfortable speaking of it because like, oh, okay. so not like in any terms of, the question, but in more so, like it feels very pretentious and uh, um, yeah. arrogant a bit, like, and, and that's just not what I ever want to come across as. But <laughs> to be honest, when you're you, when you're kind of told that you're accepted to any of these schools and Harvard especially, like, I did a strong part of me was like, dude, you'd be stupid to not. Yeah, yeah. So that was no that was agree. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> And I, um, I'm also like, why would you? Like, it's a beautiful campus. It's had a phenomenal squash program. I, I felt like I felt like I was comfortable with the team at the time when I visited. Like, there was really no red flags. Like, <laughs> so uh, you didn't overlap with a man. So I guess I was asking this because I feel like as someone who also has an older sister, I feel like. Funny thing is I went to the same school as her, even though I didn't overlap with her. I, yeah. I feel like there's a, a lot of siblings out there who don't want to take, who wanted to take like the complete polar opposite path of, yeah. you know, what their you know siblings doing, which is why I thought it was interesting that you did go to Harvard and wanted to hear like if there were other, other schools in mind that you were kind of heavily considering, you know, yeah. that you decided um, not to go there. Definitely. That was a strong uh, period of my mindset for a bit. I did not want to go to Harvard for a very long time because of that reason. Oh, and I, see. I, was like, I kind of gravitated towards more of like, it was time to make a decision. I was like, if you're really going to not do that because of this reason, <laughs> then that would again be yeah. I was a logical person. And I was like, that would just, especially because we're not overlapping. Yeah, so okay. I think it would be like maybe a stronger thing mm. to consider. Um, but I did want to go elsewhere because again, like you're just stuck kind of in that shadow of following yeah. footsteps, all the 
you know, those phrases, but it's fine. Like it gave me an opportunity to also create my own experience and and path there, which was special. Yeah. You guys truly uh, dominated during your time. Still continues to do well, so. I think she dominated a little bit more than I did, but <laughs> it's okay. I had yeah, that's that's good. Um, so I think I heard in one of the I- interviews you've done previously that it was during your time at Harvard where you were thinking, like, "There's, I'm probably not going to go professional." Um, what had changed your mind to decide uh, to go? I decided like the beginning of senior year as like all my friends were deciding yeah. um, about jobs and stuff. And again, it was just kind of like, I don't really, I mean, I was having, um, I was enjoying my squash then. And oh. I was, um, yeah, I think I was just like playing. A, I started playing a little bit of PSA and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed like the travel and the competition and stuff. And the lifestyle of that in the future excited me a bit, but I think that the, another main main factor was just like I have no idea what else I would do. And I think that's most most people out there. Yeah. Um, like no, you enter your senior year and it's like all of a sudden everyone's like, yeah, just got just got my job offer. I'm yeah, like what? Really. <laughs> when did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was probably why the main reason. I see. So a really cool feat and achievement that. Um, that many people may not know about is that you are the youngest person ever to win the U S women's nationals, which was done in 2014. And I believe you beat your sister. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that was so, so that was yeah. Crazy. You want to talk us through this? Cause I feel like this wasn't really mentioned enough. Well, just to bring it back as a reminder to Amanda and everyone out there. Thank you. I feel like no one talks about it. It's so long ago. <laughs> how old, how old were, how old was this? 2014. <laughs> Like 16, 17. I think it was, could have been 16 or 17. Really don't think it's going to be repeated ever again, considering how good the women's field is right now in U.S. <laughs> college. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't like remember it too much, but I just kind of remember like everyone after the final. I think I had a three love, and and she to be fair, she had come from like a bunch of college matches and just like flew in like maybe the day before match day of. I can't remember like the, her first match, but. She was definitely, like, not feeling her best, but, um, I don't know, everyone was just kind of like, what, just, <laughs> you know, like, it was, you know, I was like, I don't really know what happened either, like, this doesn't, this doesn't occur regularly, it's definitely an anomaly, but I guess also it kind of showed that one of the views of the game was, like, anybody can beat anybody at any mm. given day, which is part of the reason why it's such a phenomenal sport, but. Also, like, I guess looking back on it, it showed, like, a little glimpse of my capabilities and what is possible. Like, I don't know, 16. I wish I, like, had that match recorded or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if like, it was on fire or and it, like, sucked so badly. Like, <laughs> like, that, I was, like, I have no idea. I can't yeah. remember. <laughs> but just be like, okay, I guess. Okay. Wait, so I guess... Were you going to the final just being like, oh, fuck, like, like Amanda's coming off college. She's so good right now. Like, I'm going to probably lose. Or were you like, you know what? Like, I think I, she looks a little, you know, shaky right now. I think I could take this one. How, how, what? It was probably like, this is like, whatever, like, just yeah. being in the finals was an achievement. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, if I remember, I almost like lost my first round to CC Cortez and then... I think I played Olivia Blatchford in the in the semis and beat her in, I think it was four. Uh, so I was just like, kind of like, all right, this is already better than what I expected. So yeah. whenever I do enter a match with no pressure like that, I do tend to play quite well, which yeah. a lot of people do, of course, because there's no pressure and it's like, that's the most easy time to play squash. Uh, so I feel like that was probably my mindset. And how was the aftermath of that as such that you guys are a family? Yeah, I, uh, was she upset? <laughs> was... She was upset. <laughs> she was like tearing up a little bit in the, you know, when they kept us on court for the afterwards and stuff. But 
It was fine. I fine. Like I was in Virginia, so my dad and I just hit the road and had like a nine hour car ride back. And Amanda like took a flight to Boston, so we didn't like. Yeah, it was just kind of like going our separate ways. <laughs> really, it's probably. I mean, yeah, it is a crazy thing, and I feel like. You know, people might have forgotten it, so I had to remind everyone at, on the spot. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just going back to things. Uh, I wanted to get your take on how you felt, honestly, about last season. Would you say that was a successful season? Like, um, personally speaking, was it, were you frustrated with certain draws? Like, how do you feel? Oh, yeah. Um, funny enough, I ne- didn't reflect on last season. Um <laughs> But I think, like, in the beat, because it was so long, like, I don't even know where to even start reflecting on, but the main part of my reflection has been, like, probably the past three or four months or the past couple, the last couple tournaments. Mm -hmm. But I think in the beginning, I was definitely frustrated. I feel like I hit, like, Trubini and Dohar, like, a lot. And yeah, the, I, I I asked that because I saw your results and I was like, this is some yeah. ridiculous draw situation going on. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I remember. I'm like, okay, this is annoying. Getting getting annoying because I feel like yeah. it happened more often than I would have liked. But um, I think at the end of the season, probably from like, I can't even remember really what we played in and whatnot. But um, the, those like tough law probably since like April onwards. I had like a tough loss at the TOC um, against yeah. Rowan and five, and and then I had like another tough loss in oh Ky- Cairo with Amanda, and then like SJ, all like five gamers, close ones. Like those tournaments are probably the ones that I reflected on the most, and just having that awareness of like how annoying and demoralizing these losses are. Like, <laughs> yeah. Those are, I think, what um, helped bring about, like, that motivation of just, like, okay, that sucks, so let's keep working hard and, I don't know, find, you're right there with these girls, like, let's figure out a way to um, improve a bit and keep hanging in with them and hopefully change some of these losses into wins in the, in the next upcoming season. Um, but yeah. I think the biggest takeaway was just having that shift in passion and motivation. Yeah. Again, yeah. dangerous times ahead. Dangerous times ahead for no, you. No, people on tour. <laughs> Sabrina's making a clear announcement to the world right now that she's coming for <laughs> um, personal achievements in itself. And all I want to do is just keep enjoying and keep actually taking away like improvements. That's it. Yeah. Like, I see. Wait, so I, I don't want to make this a whole like ex- excuse thing for the pod, but do you feel like the draw system of how PSA are go- is is kind of there's some flaws in it because it seems like I've seen some actual complaints with literally the same draw and the same platinum events. Yeah. Do you feel like there needs to be a switch up as someone who doesn't really know the insights of it? How do you feel no about? Yeah, I'd like to. I try to not get too caught up in it. Yeah. Just because like. What are we gonna do? Like nothing. I mean, I'm not gonna expend the energy. File a complaint and just switch for yeah, like, Are you kidding me? Of course, we're gonna get the same draws. Like maybe there's like a glitch in the system. Who knows? But like, mm. it is a part of any professional sport, right? Like, I'm sure yeah. if we looked into other draw like sports systems, they would probably get similar ones. Maybe not because squash is such a small. <laughs> So there's less variety, but I don't know. Yeah, I definitely like to just be like, whatever. This is it. You yeah. gotta be if you want to be at the best. You gotta beat them all. You gotta be the best. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your what's the, what's the first tournament back for you? Is it Qatar? No, Qatar is just men's. Oh. It's um, Houston. I knew that. I knew that. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> that's. I don't want to make this political, but okay, we'll move on. <laughs> well, we have Houston, which is just with women. So that's the um, beginning of September, first week of September. Okay. Well, so that's very soon. Very soon. Yes. And right. then it just picks up and goes. Yeah. It's just nonstop after that. It really is. Yeah. It's, and it's, I had to remind myself that September is next week. And I do go to Houston <laughs> next week. And I'm like, wow. As I'm like, I'm seeing my cheese. She's recovering. <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> I'm going to move into the quick fire segment now. Cool. Just to switch it up before we do that, we're just how we start this off now is we're going to do something called creating the perfect player. 
but you can only use active players on tour right now. And there's absolutely no shame in choosing yourself for any of these answers. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. So to start this off, who do you think best forehand in the game? Best forehand? Oh, my God. I feel like I am not capable of answering this because I don't watch it. Like, I just started <laughs> watching squad. Like, I really... <laughs> after, after 20-something years of playing. <laughs> Literally, like, the lamest squad professional of all time. And then just quite recently, I was like, oh, this is actually a fun sport to watch. But... Um, let's see. Best forehand. I love Tyus forehand. I played her last week and she just, I know it's like an unconventional swing and it's, it's large and she'll uh, happily admit that, but she just has like, a hold on it that uh -huh. makes it incredibly deceptive and incredibly hard to read. And, and I think any hold and like Shabini has a backhand hold. It's just, it makes it takes it to another level where it just adds that difficulty of moving because you're stuck in the same, you know, you're like just stuck mm -hmm. there on the tee waiting and it's so difficult. So I think her forehand is really, really challenging to play. I don't know if it's the best, but it's just the most For you difficult. it is. For you it's the most challenging. Most difficult, yeah. For me yeah. How about backhand? I'm, is it El Shabini? It could be, yeah. She also has, I like, I like a good hold and she has one. Yeah. Has, really uh makes it tricky but damn now do you ask everybody about these yeah questions? i do oh. I, well this one i added recently because people were saying your quick fire questions are getting boring so i oh, added okay. this um well luckily I'm, I'm happy i didn't listen to past ones because then i yeah. would have had a little bias but <laughs> um yeah i think i think those two those two okay uh best movement best movement I think Gina Kennedy is just like, Gina. she's on it. Yeah. She's on it. She's strong. She's fast. You can change well, you've been, you've been teammates with her, right? Um, yeah, I have. Has she always been like that throughout her college years? She has. Okay. Well, I guess yeah. you'll always have it over her that you've always played number one on the ladder. Yeah. Um, Honestly, I don't even know how. All I remember from our like challenge matches is they would be like, 12, 10, 13, 11 in the fifth, nearly every time. And you always and squeezed it out. It would flip flop, but like somehow I ended up playing ahead of her. <laughs> Thank know. you for clearing the air that you guys weren't stacking the ladder. It's going to report to the uh, <laughs> college squash assist. <laughs> I don't think you guys were. Right. Um, but um, how about best mental game? Best mental game? Yeah. I think on the women's, like, Kanya has the best mental game. She's like this. Biggest uh, and Gohar, you can say both oh, yeah. of them. But I'm sure those are probably uh, can't wait for those two to play again. Probably, yeah, <laughs> but they are just like I am not giving up, you know, at all. Like it's yeah. inspiring, really. I definitely went through a period of time where you're like down personally, you're like down to love, and you're like this is over, or like you're down like six three, and you're like this is over. Like they give your you flight back. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Like no, it's never over. Like I'm winning yeah. this, regardless of the score, the the opponent. It's it's remarkable. Yeah. Well, there you have it. It's very broad, but there's Sabrina's perfect player. Um. <laughs> <Not poor enough. laughs> very unique answers. Would have never thought of those. Um. I don't do well with quick fires. <laughs> Okay, how about, how about, no, I got a bunch more for you, don't worry. Uh, who do you think is the best ref on tour, or a ref that you like, ref in your match? You don't know the refs. Maybe, like, I mean, I wouldn't even know, like, maybe Mike Riley. Mike Riley. Damn. Just because, like, I feel like I just know them since I was very young. Oh, uh, so no, no, none of that sweet talking before matches to make sure you get the bias in. <laughs> no, <to> these... <laughs> Just, you know, casual conversations, the light in the mood, but no. I see. I mean, I feel like you don't really get into it with the refs, so it doesn't really matter yeah. who, who's refing you. I couldn't even name more than name three. <laughs> yeah, I was concerned <laughs> when I when you told me that you don't watch much, that you're not going to know the names. But um, we're going to do some spicy questions now. Best best dress player on tour? Best dress? Um, I like to say Lisa Aikens. He always has some, yeah. I'm sure that was a popular response. He has yeah. some nice dresses. I'm probably the least best dress. I just wear the same <laughs> clothes that I've had since I was 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Maybe that's the goal for this season. 
<laughs> Upgrade. Any any new kits coming up your way or for, no. for the Houston? <laughs> <laughs> I have three months to prepare so they're not Listen guys, she's really structured her off season so perfectly and structurally <laughs> that um well the next question's funny. I, I actually don't want you picking yourself for this, but who do you who's the worst stress player on tour or a nice way to put it is who needs work in your opinion? <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> I feel like the women being like these girls are looking good. I, I think Lisa Lisa disagreed. I think Lisa dropped a couple names when she she did not drop your name. Do not worry. Pink on Wednesdays all the time. I think a lot of people have actually dropped Nora's name. Noral Tayev, yeah, and Farag also. Okay. Why is classic with the Dahl look? He's also with the collar shirts. Yeah, I mean, but it runs in the family now with Farag taking the yeah. old school, tucking the shirt a little. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about next question is who would who is one player or anyone in the squash community that you would like to see in the commentators booth? Oh, well. I feel like, uh, ooh, the people that are pretty, uh, I feel like Holly Naughton would be cool in the commentators box. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh. People who aren't just, like, afraid to say whatever it is out there. <laughs> uh, it would be fun and entertaining to have. I'd love to see, actually, I know there's so many tournaments in Egypt, like, can we get her name out there? I, I'd love to hear yeah. her expertise. I don't even know if she watches so much squash, but that would, that would be fun. Have you ever been invited or have you ever considered yourself in that booth? Yeah, I would I would be uh happily accepting of that offer. Maybe for like a, one match to start, I don't know. I, I don't know how good I'd be. <laughs> well, I, I think you're the first person who's actually said, "Yeah, I would be down." Really? Yeah, everyone's like, "No, absolutely not." Why not? not I mean, <laughs> they're watching the match anyway. Maybe we'll sit with a microphone and chat with somebody next to you. <laughs> Make it more entertaining. Yeah. Um, we'll be happily uh, doing it with Lisa. Yeah, that would be quite the quite the duo out there. Yeah. Um, if you were competing in the softball world doubles world championships, who would you want as your partner, both on the women's side and the men uh, for mixed? Ooh. I feel like I would have to put Amanda for the, the singles. Yeah. The single, the women's. Yeah. Um, we have played doubles events and as much as like, she stresses me out on court. Like <laughs> it works. I don't know why it works, but it just, is she an intense partner to have? <laughs> she is. And you can visibly tell when she's like aware that I'm like flustered because of her intensity. So then she like, Oh, uh, okay. Like, it's, yeah. But um, she's also a lefty, so that helped. And I that, think just yeah. experience playing, like, previous uh, events in doubles will, would help that. And then for men's, um, keeping, I, I'm keeping it on the U.S. side. And I would say Todd Parody. Yeah. We're friends. And uh, I think it's important to be friends with your partner. Yeah. And, I don't know. I think it would be a good mix. Cool. How about what are your thoughts on nicknames for PSA players, and what are your thoughts on your own nickname for the people who don't know her nickname? She's, I think she's got two. She's got the Beans and Road Runner. Yeah, I, I think the Road Runner is for PSA, and Beans is just like a general uh, nickname. Um, I kind of like the Road Runner. <laughs> like really weird and kind of like brutal nicknames out there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Roadrunner, I was like, I will take that. <laughs> Definitely take that. Um, I think they're fun. Like, it's good to have some nicknames. It's important. It adds some kind of humor and lightness to the sport yeah. in the game. But some of them could be reworked. <laughs> Ooh, is there anything you had in mind that you're like, what, what, what was that nickname? Not like I, if I was shown a list of the nicknames names maybe i'd yeah. be able to point them out but uh, like right now it's been so long since i heard yeah. them so i kind of 
can't remember all of them, but. Well, I guess for a future idea, you could have the Roadrunner embroidered because I think a lot of people do that on their kits. Yeah. That could be a potential oh, idea. I don't even know. What is it? Like, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Like, a or something? I don't know. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah, you get that. Um, I mean, you, could, you, could, you could draw it yourself, you know, plug the Instagram handle on the art. Could be <laughs> marketing, marketing. <laughs> If only I knew of these ideas in June, so I had some time to work on <laughs> have, you th- have you thought of coaching post-career as a, like a squash coach or not? Yeah, I have. I think yeah. it very much so depends on if I'm like done with, you know, like mentally done with squash by the end of this career. I don't know how yeah. long it'll last, so it's like hard to tell, but I like, I do like coaching just as a whole and I think squash coaching, but like within the college coach range could be something that I'm passionate about and interested in. Um, I don't know if I would really um, enjoy just being like a, I don't know, just a regular coach oh. giving lessons all day. Um, I actually admire those who do that because I've given some back-to-back lessons and you're like, <laughs> oh my, it's like the hardest. But the last one, you're like, I can't even... Focus, I can't move. Like, it's really I think it's more tiring than playing squash. Um, just like having to stand still, like not really move around, but just be yeah. up. So, it is nonsense. I don't think I can do those back to back lessons. Life. <laughs> um, I see. And who do you think is the most underrated player on tour? Ooh, that's a good question. Um. I kind of, I don't know, if I'm, like, the first person that comes to mind is Melissa Alves. We uh, did mm-hmm. an exhibition together and spent some time this summer together. Yeah. Um, and I know she was injured last season, so she didn't have, like, that full season to try and, like, to show up, uh, just, like, compete a bit with everybody else. But she's a phenomenal squash player, and she's incredibly hardworking and driven and motivated and I think she has a lot of potential and is a bit underrated at the moment. Nice. Um, I think, yeah, I think she, I recently saw the European champion. She's, she done, she's done well. Um, how about most overrated player? Ooh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay. Know. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it's obvious that I'm making Serena uncomfortable with this question. I'm going to switch it up to, Who's one player that you don't really like playing against? Maybe in terms of like style clash. That I don't like playing against. I mean, I don't like playing against Gohar. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> obviously not. Like that is just so difficult. Is it the big like, swing, or is it just like is it just everything in general encompassing? The fast pace, like yeah, it's, it's so difficult. Um, yeah, I don't even care too much for the big swing because I feel like I kind of navigate, try to navigate like out of anywhere mm. that's remotely close to my opponent most times, but uh, it's just, yeah, like uh, the paces, the pickups that you get, you just have to win the rally with the most precise shots and I just, you don't get any rest because you don't have time to slow down the ball. <laughs> it's like oh man, I want to breathe out here. <laughs> Obviously, world number yeah. one. Or I don't know, world number one <laughs> right now is she? I don't know. Yeah, she is. She is. She is the world number one right now. Yeah. Um, right, too, so. Um, so I'm going to switch it over to some life-related questions. Not no, no longer squash, but Sabrina, if you're shipwrecked on an island, all your mm-hmm. basics are covered. What are the two things you bring with you? Ooh. Um. I mean. Can I, I mean, I would like to bring a book. Um, like, can I bring a Kindle so I have access to all the books? Kind of a cheat code of an answer right there, but oh, sure. So. <laughs> you only bring one book. Um, I feel like it would be, a, like, my mom's reading The Goldfinch right now, and I recommended it to her because it's one of my favorite books. So mm-hmm. that's the one that would come to mind right now. So I'd bring The Goldfinch and... Um, is there a specific genre of books that you like the most, or are you like open to? Yeah, I say. Yeah, 
try to get it in nonfiction, but it's like not nonfiction as fun stuff. As it's nonfiction like, stuff, yeah. Um, ooh, maybe like a hammock. <laughs> that, that is covered. That is a good answer. That is actually a really good answer. Look at um, hammock. I don't yeah. Happy out there. <laughs> Be comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Like, pull down, yeah. How about best and worst purchase you've ever made? Oh God. Um, I don't know. Not. I feel like I don't like learn no, no, crazy no, things. Yeah. Um, looking around my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> what have I bought that I would probably not have had? <laughs> Um, oh, I'm sitting next, or like in front of me is my record player, and I feel like I use that pretty often. Oh, do you like class, play classical music? I do like classical music, but I also like a whole wide range of things. I see. Um, yeah, I don't know the worst purchase. Not, not just not not a big spend. It seems like a common theme among squash players. <laughs> I was gonna say like maybe like a a flight via Ryanair or Spirit Airlines or something. <laughs> like, you just know it's gonna be so bad. For Such me. a bad experience. Like, yeah, like, three hundred dollars cheaper. So I gotta do it. <laughs> and like a five hour layover yeah, exactly. in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's like you're gonna be miserable for twenty four hours, but I'm saving twenty five bucks. <laughs> How about biggest pet peeves for Sabrina? Um, biggest pet peeves. One of my biggest pet peeves is gum chewing. Like, like I just really oh. don't enjoy it. I see. Oh, is it also, how about like chewing loudly as well? Is that a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe chewing with your mouth, gum chewing yeah. with your mouth open. I'm like, Oof. gotta stop that <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Um, I guess I have more. And yeah, yeah, give us give us one more, one more pet peeve. Like my family would be able to answer this for me very well, but right now it's like is there like an extensive list of things that get on your ears? Or like they know that I I really dislike they they definitely know about the gum chewing because my my dad's sister and brother to go mess and they like oh my god they know they don't they know to not even offer the video <laughs> uh, so yeah that's the number one i see okay you get ticked off too easily so kind of wanting to keep the pet peeves limited yep well yeah i think i'm gonna wrap it up there um well sabrina thank you so much for joining yeah. in that was loads of fun and I appreciate Thanks. your time. Thanks so much for having me. That was a lot of fun. Hopefully I provided some good quality answers and and staying away from any uh, <laughs> <laughs> no context PSA. <laughs> uh, yeah, special shout out to no context PSA for catching that blurb. I actually, yeah, the, the person who submitted it, yeah, to be saying, I, I caught it. <laughs> so shout out to him. But yeah, thank you so much. I-